order, questions to the Secretary of State for Justice, Gareth Johnson. For one, sir. Uh, Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Sentencing must match the severity of the crime, uh, but there is persuasive evidence showing short sentences do not work in helping some offenders turn their backs on crime. Uh, That's why we're exploring options which should see them used much less frequently. Gareth Johnson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, a deeply concerning incident took place in my constituency in the weekend involving an assault using a noxious substance. Can I ask the Secretary of State for a clear commitment that not only will the sale and possession of acid be targeted, but also to ensure that those who are guilty of these despicable and evil crimes receive significant terms of imprisonment? Well, I'm grateful to my honourable friend for raising uh, a very serious instance, and attacks like these are truly dreadful, with life-changing consequences, and anyone committing such acts must feel the full force of the law. Um, That is why the Offensive Weapons Bill, uh, currently in the Lords, will uh, change the law to stop the sale of acid acid to under-18s and make it an offence to possess a corrosive substance in a public place. It is for the independent courts to determine the sentence handed down in individual cases, but it is already the case that for any offence, the use of a weapon including acid, will be treated as an aggravating factor meriting an increased sentence. Lily Reeves. Speaker, statistics show that 36% of rough sleepers in London have previously been in prison, up 3% from the year before. This is deeply concerning, and short sentences do nothing but exacerbate the uh, issue and uh, do not uh, reduce uh, reoffending. Uh, does the Minister not agree with me that it is now time to introduce a presumption against prison sentences less than 12 months? Yeah. Well, I am very grateful for her question, and she makes a very important point because, of course, if someone is sentenced to a short sentence, that can mean that they lose their, uh, their home. Uh, that puts them in a, a more difficult position. They are then released, and they are much more risk of rough sleeping. So uh, the Honourable Member raises an important point. We are looking at our options in this particular area. I welcome her support uh, for that. It is also worth pointing out that we are uh, making efforts in terms of addressing rough sleeping with pilots in Pentonville, Bristol and Leeds to see what we can do to address this particular problem. Neil. I very much welcome uh, the Secretary of State's uh, approach to a much more realistic and nuanced approach to sentencing and the use of imprisonment. Would he agree that what is essential is that we have space in our prisons for those whose crimes are so serious that only custody is appropriate, but we do not overcrowd prisons with those who have either mental or or medical difficulties, literacy or social problems, or who might be better dealt with in the community by rigorous community sentences. I I completely agree with the point that the Chair of the Justice Select Committee uh, makes. There are serious crimes that are committed, uh, that uh, a custodial sentence and a strong custodial sentence is exactly the right answer. But there are also cases where short sentences in particular are ineffective in terms of rehabilitation. Uh, They're not serving society well, uh, and that is why uh, prison should be for those where it is appropriate, and we should look to develop alternatives to prison wherever possible. Gavin Newlands. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I'm heartened by the Secretary's answers thus far. Last September, the Prisons Minister said that the evidence and what would be done to reduce reoffending by not exercising overusing sorry, short prison sentences inappropriately is a good lesson from Scotland from which we wish to learn. But at Holyrood, the Scottish Conservatives have long campaigned against the presumption against short mm-hmm. sentences, claiming it to be a soft touch approach. Yep. Does he agree with me that it's the Scottish Conservatives that are out of touch and wanting to pursue an old fashioned and here, entirely here. ineffective approach? Here, here. Well well I will focus on the approach that I want to take in England and Wales. Uh, and I think if we can find uh, effective alternatives to short sentences, uh, then it 's not a question of uh, uh, being uh, pursuing a soft justice approach. It is a, a, an approach to ensure that we are uh, pursuing smart justice, effective in reducing reoffending and reducing crime that 's the approach that I want to take in England and Wales. Mr. Desmond Swain. But the full force of the law too often isn 't very forceful at all. Is it? Well, uh, 
the, the reality is that in recent years sentences have gone up and the prison population has gone up. And, and I maintain the point that uh, there are circumstances where significant prison sentences are right as a means of punishment, as a demonstration of society's uh, abhorrence at particular behaviour. But I think we also have to bear in mind that there are people who go to prison uh, who are in, are end up in a cycle of uh, re-offending. Little is achieved for the benefit of society or the individuals concerned. Cunningham. Number two, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, with your permission, I would like to uh, answer questions 2, 19 and 20 together. Uh, we have been clear that probation needs to improve and have taken decisive action to end current CRC contracts and develop more robust arrangements to protect the public and tackle reoffending. Uh, we have seen examples of good and innovative work from CRCs in Cumbria, adapting probation to a rural setting, and in London, working with the Mayor's Office on programmes to rehabilitate offenders. Uh, involved in knife crime, I do believe that public, private and voluntary organisations all have a role to play. Uh, the reforms we are making are crucial to better integrate the system so that different providers can work more effectively together, and we will set out our proposals later this year. Secretary of State's intended grouping is with question 18, that of the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Easington, who is looking mildly perturbed and I hope will now be greatly reassured. It's good to see him reassured. Alex Cunningham. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm grateful for that comprehensive answer. But given the prison minister's praise at the last Justice Questions for the not-for-profit Durham Tees Valley CRC, one of the best, if not the best, at inspection, and according to NAPO, also one of the best to work for, how will the Secretary of State protect this rare success story when his own reprivatisation plans are set to allow security guys like Sodexo to swallow it up? Well, I also want to pay tribute to the work for the not-for-profit CRC in Durham Tees Valley uh, and its focus on rehabilitating uh, offenders. Uh, the expertise and commitment for not-for-profit organisations uh, is vital in helping offenders turn their lives around, and the changes we are working on will ensure that probation benefits from having a diverse range of providers whilst also doing more to deliver operational stability. Graham Morris. Thanks, uh, and, and I thank the, the Minister for, for that uh, answer and for uh, pointing out the successes that we've had in Durham. F failures in probation cause reoffending and place strains on already overburdened police resources. So, would the Minister consider meeting with the Police and Crime Commissioners, such as Ron Hogg, uh, who happens to be head of the only outstanding police force in the country in Durham, to discuss the devolution of probation services so that it could be tailor-made to meet the needs of local communities? Well, on the subject of meeting with police and crime commissioners, I have already met a number of police and crime commissioners on this very issue, and I would be happy to meet Mr Hogg, uh, as well as other police and crime commissioners, again, uh, to discuss these matters. Uh, and we are wanting to ensure that police and crime commissioners can play a, a full and active role uh, in this process, uh, and I am heartened by the determination and willingness of many police and crime commissioners uh, to want to do all they can uh, to uh, help uh, uh, develop this uh, process and ensure that we've got a strong probation system. Goodwill. Number three, sir. Mr. Speaker, turning around drugs in prison involves focus on relationships, staffs, and perimeter security. But for the first time in every one of those ten prisons, we're going to have proper dog teams in place, X ray scanners, full airport style security. And I believe this will drive down the drugs in those prisons, and I expect to be judged on those results. Goodwill. The Minister uh, won the admiration of the nation when he put his neck on the line in pursuit of his ambitious targets to uh, reduce drugs and violence in our prisons. Could I ask what other practical steps he's taking to achieve these so that, to make sure that our prisons not only keep the prisoners in but keep the drugs out? Minister. So, in addition to searching people at the gates, we're investing more in netting, we're investing more in grilling, and we're also investing a great deal more in staff training and support. I was very lucky to be able to be at Newbold Revel, our police uh, prison officer training college, last week to see the passing out parade of a new set of individuals bringing standards to these ten prisons. Stephen Hepburn. Violence in prisons 
have reached record levels, with assaults on prison officers up by 30%. When is the government re going to realise that it's their cuts that are causing this crisis in our prison service? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The assaults on prison officers are genuinely shocking. That's why we've doubled the sentence for assaults on prison officers. That's also why we're putting investment into perimeter security. And that's why I have said that if I do not bring that violence down, including assaults on prison officers, I will resign. And then Victoria Prentice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When I last visited HMB Bullington, it was explained to me that much of prisoners' mail is saturated with drugs. Yeah. How is the plan going to photocopy mail where appropriate? Every, every one of the ten prisons where we're running these pilots will either photocopy the mail or put it through a RAPI scanner which will identify spice and other psychoactive substances to make sure that prisoners cannot use mail to bring drugs into prison. In calling the Honourable Gentleman the Member for Huddersfield, I congratulate him upon his tie, inserting only the modest caveat that it is perhaps a tad understated. Yeah. Mr Barry Sherman. <laughs> this is my celebration of Autism Day, Mr Speaker. A uh, little bit of flamboyance for autism. We're all there. Could, can I say to the Secretary of State, uh, to, to, to the Minister, that nobody wants our prisons to be, have a culture of drugs and violence. But can you imagine what it's like to be in prison and not to be guilty. I uh, co-chair the, uh, the Miscarriages of Justice uh, group, and we're meeting tonight. But the fact is, some people do 18 years in prison, are found guilty, have no compensation, and no reintroduction back into society. When are we going to do something about this? Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I think this is a slightly different subject, but I'd be very, very happy to sit down with the Honourable Member for Huddersfield to look exactly at these very rare but very tragic cases where somebody is wrongfully convicted. Alphon. Number four, sir. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, domestic abuse is a dreadful crime. We are determined to ensure that those who commit it face justice and those who are victims of it are supported and feel able to come forward. There are a range of measures currently available to support them in taking their abuser to court, including, for example, eligibility to apply for special measures, things like the use of video links and recorded evidence. But we believe we can and should do more, as we set out in the draft domestic abuse bill published last week. Robert Halford. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, in June 2012, Estina Blunny, a 20-year-old heavily pregnant young woman, was uh, unlawfully uh, beaten to death by... Uh, her abusive former partner with the death of the unborn child as well. Despite the uh, abuser being known to the authorities and the prosecution service, will my honourable friend take steps to strengthen the support and protection available to victims of domestic abuse to help prevent tragedies like this from ever happening again in the future so we never ever have such a situation like this occurring in Harlow again? Um, I think my... Right, honourable friend, I was very, very sorry to hear about that dreadful and tragic case of Eastner Lumi in his constituency. Strengthening, Estina. Estina. Strengthening those protections that are available for victims lies at the heart of the draft bill. Measures in that draft bill include automatic eligibility for special measures in court for domestic abuse victims and a new domestic abuse protection order to enforce more stringent conditions on suspected and convicted perpetrators where breach will constitute a criminal offence to better protect victims. Um, Sammy Woodhouse and I met with the Minister's colleague before Christmas. I wonder whether he could update the House on action taken after that meeting, particularly in relation to guidance issued to local authorities on the exemption on the duty to notify, and whether his department is willing to conduct a review to get to the heart of the scale of the issue that affected Sammy. I'm very grateful to the Honourable Lady, both for her question, but also I pay tribute to her and to Sammy for the work that they have done in highlighting this terrible situation and what more can be done. I know she had a very positive meeting with my Honourable and learned friend, fellow Parliamentary Under Secretary of State, and we are determined that the family court system should never be used in a way to coerce us or re-victimise those who have been abused. My honourable friend is liaising with the Association of Directors of Social Services in respect of council's obligations and has invited the President of the Family Division to consider clarifying the practice direction regarding notification. Sir Geoffrey Clifton Brown. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The PAC yesterday did an inquiry into children's social services. Would my honourable friend agree that domestic violence is one of the key 
causes why we're seeing a growth in children being taken into care in local authorities, would his department work very closely with the Department for Education to make sure that children's social services have the information and finances they need to deal with this increasing problem? I am grateful to my honourable friend for that question. I can offer him the reassurance that we are working extremely closely with colleagues across government to do this. What we often see in some of the young people who end up um, going into the criminal justice system is they have often come from homes or families where they have seen or witnessed domestic abuse, and it's absolutely incumbent upon all of us to do all we can to tackle it. Mr Speaker, Practice Direction 12J requires that a court must be sure that in ordering parental contact, the child or other parent is not at risk of harm. Though the direction makes clear it is an obligatory requirement, campaign groups and lawyers say its implementation is patchy, and we saw this in the Sammy Woodhouse case. Will the Government task the new Domestic Abuse Commissioner with responsibilities for monitoring its implementation with annual reports of any breaches laid before Parliament? I'm very grateful to the Shadow Minister, and I know I should have said when referring to the Honourable Lady, I know the Shadow Minister's concern about this case and her work on it. As I've set out, in the shorter term, we've asked the President of the Family Division to look at that uh, practice guidance and whether it is working as it should. She mentions the Domestic Abuse Commissioner in the context of the Draft Domestic Abuse Bill. That Domestic Abuse Commissioner will have the powers to investigate and look into these matters. I'm very happy to meet with her as my opposite number to discuss how that might work in practice. Vicky Ford. Question number five, please. Uh, The scourge of violence in prisons must be tackled. To do this, we need to get the basics right. We have strengthened the front line with over 4,300 new staff so that we can run full, purposeful regimes and move to a new key worker model to support prisoners. We are also supporting prisoners with measures to tackle drugs and make the physical environment in prisons decent and safe. Ford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We know that a positive working relationship between staff and prisoners is key to running a safe, decent prisons. Can my right hon. Friend uh, tell us more about what is being done to improve the relationships between staff and prisoners? Uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right, and can I pay tribute to the work that she does? She, I know she's a very frequent visitor to Chelmsford Prison in her capacity as constituency yeah. MP, uh, and, uh, and I understand she may almost have her own cell, such as the regularity of her visits. But um, she highlights a, a very important point, which is, which is the, the relationship between prison officers and prisoners, and we are introducing across the prison estate the key workers program. Uh, early signs are that that is making a positive difference in terms of relationships and in terms of reducing violence. Uh, there's more work that we need to do, but I am pleased that we are able to do that and uh, ensuring that uh, prison officers get the training they need uh, to make best use of that. West. Mr Speaker, out-of-control drug use in prisons fuels violence. Yesterday I met with the member for Thurrock, who is the Minister of Health, dealing with this issue, and I want to know what further can be done, both before a prisoner enters the prison system and afterwards, and during that crucial period, while usually he is there, to have proper drug rehab so that the time is not wasted in prison. Well, again, the Honourable Member makes an important point. We have formed a drugs task force working with law enforcement and health partners across government to restrict supply, reduce demand and build recovery. Uh, The task force is developing a national drug strategy which will provide all prisons with guidance and examples of best practice to support them in uh, tackling drugs. I should also point out that we are investing £6 million in 10 of the most challenging prisons to to tackle drug supply and reduce demand. Uh, and uh, uh, there is a greater focus on drug detection, on dedicated search teams, on body, body scanners, uh, and improved perimeter defences. Purposeful activity for prisoners is vital to encourage rehabilitation and to reduce the volatility in our jails. What steps are being taken to drive down the number of prisoners who are locked up for 23 hours a day, something which does not help the peace of our prisoners? Well, again, I I agree, and the additional prison officers that we have, the additional 4,300 prison officers, can help ensure that we uh, do that. And uh, a particular area where I have been very keen to focus has been our education and 
employment strategy, ensuring that uh, we, have, uh, uh, we provide prisoners, those who are prepared to take responsibility, with the opportunity to educate themselves and also so that to, to prepare themselves for a world of work. Uh, and that's something I'm very keen to see us continue to do. We found out from his department last week the alarming figure that 51% of our youth offenders come now from a black, minority or ethnic background. It puts us worse than the United States. Given that context in our prisons, will he revisit my review and can I meet with him urgently to discuss how we accelerate progress? Well, I'm grateful to that question. I'd be very happy to meet with the Honourable Member. I know he regularly meets uh, with the, uh, my parliamentary under-secretary on this area. I, I'm also concerned about the proportion of BAME children in custody. This is something we take very seriously, and my department has introduced a dedicated team within the Youth Justice Policy Unit with a key focus on explaining or changing disproportionate outcomes for BA BAME children in the justice system. Again. Speaker, the Justice Secretary has been in post for just over a year. In that time, every set of prison safety figures shows violence spiralling out of control. In January 2018, assaults were up 12% year on year, reaching new record highs. In April 2018, assaults were up 13%, reaching new record highs. In October 2018, assaults were up 20%, reaching new record highs. And last week, we saw yet more record highs. A record a record high for assaults on staff, a record high for prisoner on prisoner violence, and a record high for self harm. Does the Secretary of State agree his government has lost control of violence in our prisons, and when will they get a grip? Well, clearly, the figures that were set out last week, which relate to what was happening in uh, July, August, and September last year, uh, are not acceptable, and we do need to bring those numbers down. But that is why we have increased the number of prison officers staff. That is why we are focusing on purposeful activity. That is why we are taking steps in terms of uh, reducing both the uh, supply and demand of drugs. Uh, and we are uh, seeing some encouraging signs, but I don't want to make too much of that as yet, because I think we'll need to wait to see the, uh, uh, the numbers in April when we will have details about the last quarter of 2018, but uh, I, I, I am beginning to feel that we have turned around the corner, that the additional staff are making a difference, the measures that we are taking are making a difference, but I fully accept there is still much work that needs to be done. Andrew Bridgen. Question 6, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, I would, uh, uh, with your permission, I would like to group uh, question 6 with 24. Uh, we do not tolerate violence against our dedicated and hard-working prison officers. We are strengthening frontline officer numbers and rolling out the key worker scheme so that we can improve prisoner staff relationships and tackle the causes of violence. Um, we are giving officers the tools they need, like body-worn cameras and PAVA, to respond where incidents do occur. Vision. Thank the Secretary of State for that answer. But in order to protect prison officers, what measures are the government taking to ensure that the police and the justice uh, system take crimes committed in prison as seriously as those committed outside in the community? Uh, I, I think my honourable friend makes a fair point that it is important that crimes committed within prisons are taken seriously, just as crimes outside prisons are taken uh, seriously. Uh, there are a number of steps that we have made. I have already alluded to uh, some of the measures that we have taken to uh, help prison officers in these uh, circumstances. It is also the case that uh, we, of course, recently have changed the law to strengthen the sentences against those uh, who commit crimes against prison officers. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, a week before Christmas, uh, one of my local pr prison officers, Ashley McLean, received horrendous facial injuries when he was violently attacked by a prisoner who was allegedly high on spice. This isn't an isolated incident. It happens every day of every week in one or other of our prisons. Much of that violent behaviour, as we've heard, is caused by drugs. So would my right honourable friend tell me what steps are being taken to increase sentences for those found guilty of supplying drugs to inmates. 
Well, I'm grateful to my honourable friend, and he rightly highlights uh, a horrific incident. Uh, and I know that the prisons minister uh, has already uh, replied to a letter to him on this matter. We are, we are fully committed to addressing the significant increase that we have seen in the number of assaults on our hard-working prison staff. The new Assaults on Emergency Workers Act increases the penalty for those who assault emergency workers, including prison officers. Uh, and I understand in this particular case that the police are continuing to investigate this incident. Speaker, we have already heard that assaults against prison officers are at record levels and rising levels at a record rate. So why is the Secretary of State more interested in taking prison officers to court for raising health and safety concerns than sitting around the table and working with them to develop an urgent violence reduction strategy? Well, we are very focused on reducing violence. That's why we're taking the measures that we are. That's why we're introducing the extra staff. That's why we're giving prison officers access to PARBA, why we're increasing the use of body-worn cameras, why we're increasing measures uh, to stop drugs getting into prisons, which, as we've already heard, can often be a driver for uh, such violence. Uh, so that is precisely uh, what we are uh, doing, uh, and we will continue to do. Sevens. I recently met with someone who trained me as a prison officer, left the job after six months. He told me that the three months training left him ill-equipped with the violence, the intimidation, and also having to deal with prisoners who have mental health problems. He will know this is not a isolated case and this is widespread. What is he doing to improve training for police or, uh, prison officers so they're equipped to deal with these incidents and to have support when they are encountering this type of violence? Well, let me, let me assure you, we are constantly looking at ways in which we can improve the training for prison officers. It's a matter in which the, uh, uh, my honourable friend, the prisons minister, has been uh, very focused. Uh, it, it is also the case that we have significantly managed to increase the number of prison officers. And as I say, it's up by 4,300. And what we are now seeing is, is those prison officers are gaining more experience. They are becoming increasingly effective. Uh, and uh, as, as I said, I, 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 there are reasons to be carefully and cautiously optimistic uh, that we are moving in the right direction, but there's still much more that needs to be done. Thank you, um, Mr Speaker. What specific assessment has he made of the opportunities associated with the use of body-worn cameras by prison officers, given the successes that we've seen in policing? Well, I think, again, my honourable friend is, is right to uh, highlight this, and the increased use of body-worn cameras uh, can help ensure that we have got evidence, uh, evidence that uh, can uh, ensure that uh, wrongdoing by prisoners uh, can be uh, uh, brought to uh, brought to book and uh, enabling prosecutions to be brought. It also provides um, uh, some, uh, an, an ability to ensure that the truth can always be discovered, which I think is important. So I think body-worn cameras are not the sole answer, but they are part of an answer as to how we can uh, bring this down. And the nearly 6,000 additional body-worn cameras alongside staff training is something which I think can uh, help us move in the right direction. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Every assault on a prison officer is, of course, uh, one too many. However, in the last few years, there were five times, five times fewer serious assaults um, in Scottish prisons um, on of than in English and Welsh prisons on officers. <coughs> Given this stark contrast and the fact that well, the, this government were slashing prison, numbers by, uh, prison officer numbers by nearly a third, the numbers in Scotland actually rose. Uh, will I meet with the Scottish Government to discuss what he could learn from Scotland's approach to this issue also? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we have a cooperative relationship with the Scottish Government, and I hope that that, that will continue. Uh, but let me you know, point out, since October uh, 2016, we have seen an increase in prison officer numbers uh, of uh, 4,300. Uh, that is something to be welcomed. I, I think there was a stage where people said, well, that's new numbers, but they're very inexperienced. But of course, as each month goes by, those prison officers are gaining more experience, gaining more confidence. Uh, and I believe that we can see improvements in the uh, months and years ahead. Seven, sir. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to pay tribute to the Honourable Member for Kettering for advocating on this issue consistently and for reinforcing a policy which has led to nearly 45,000 foreign national offenders being deported. In answer to the question of the 110 prisoner transfer agreements that we have, 
46 of them are compulsory. But it is worth pointing out that were we to leave the European Union with no deal and no transition period, we would lose 26 of those, and we would face significantly greater challenges in deporting foreign national offenders who constitute nearly 40% of that cohort. Understand that of those 26 EU agreements, only about 200 prisoners have been compulsory transferred to other EU countries, so that will make little difference. The point is that uh, at any one time, 10% of our prison population is made up of foreign national offenders. The best way to reduce overcrowding is to send these people back to prison in their own country. Will the Minister negotiate more compulsory prisoner transfer agreements so we can get these people back to prisons in their own abode? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Minister! I agree very strongly with the Honourable Member for Kettering, and indeed we are very actively engaged in this. My right honourable friend, uh, the Lord Chancellor, will be in Romania discussing these issues. I am meeting, for example, with the Albanian Justice Minister this afternoon. But it is important to understand if you are going to put someone back into prison in another country, that country's police, that country's courts, that country's prison service needs to be on side, and that is a diplomatic challenge. David Drew. Thank you, Mr Speaker. One of the saddest groups in our prison are those women from abroad, usually with children, who have been duped into being drug mules. In the past, the government has helped with the building of prisons abroad to allow those women to be back in their country of origin. Is that still the policy of this government? Uh, As a former DFID minister, I can assure you that we remain very open to that. The the problems that she faced recently in Jamaica is there has been political resistance to British development money being used in that way, not from us, but from the Jamaican government. But we remain very open in our investment in rule of law, and if it helps us to return foreign national offenders back at the same time as helping prisoners in that country, we will do that. Ellen Hayes. Question 8, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I'd like to assure the Honourable Member that any decision to close a court is taken incredibly carefully. But in circumstances where 41% of courts in 2016 to 17 were operating at half their available capacity, it's right that the Ministry of Justice considers how best to spend their resources. We are investing a billion pounds in our courts, bringing them up to date, improving back office systems, and making it easier for people to access justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Three years ago, I raised concerns about the impact that the closure of Lambeth County Court would have on the efficiency of the court system and access to justice for my constituents. Lambeth was closed two years ago, and the workload moved to Clerkenwell and Shoreditch. Yesterday, I heard from a local legal aid solicitor that Clerkenwell and Shoreditch County Court is completely overwhelmed, that delays of six to eight months to receive court directions are common, and the contact centre cannot provide up-to-date information on cases. When will the government Act to sort out this shambolic mess. Well, I'm very happy to meet with the Honourable Member to discuss the specific situation. There are a number of steps that the MOJ are taking to improve court timeliness, which is, of course, important. We are digitalising a number of services. We now you can track your appeal for a tribunal online. We are uh, recruiting more judges to tribunals. Uh, over 225 um, will be recruited in tribunals over the last year, but I'm very happy to discuss her particular case. Uh, Richard Bergen. Under the smoke screen of a digital revolution, the Government has taken the axe to our court system. A victim of crime who wants justice through their day in court will now have a much more difficult experience, perhaps having to travel much further after the closure of hundreds of courts, perhaps finding a lack of the help and support they need after the sacking of thousands of court staff. So, given the recent chaos, instead of forcing through yet more court reforms, Will she agree to a moratorium on further cuts and closures, at least until this House has been offered a chance to scrutinise changes that will affect access to justice for decades to come? Uh, Mr Speaker, the Honourable Member is right to identify that there was an IT issue which affected our courts uh, towards the end of January. That was a disruption which was caused by an infrastructure issue in our suppliers' data, and I apologise for any issues uh, for people were, which were affected by that. Um, but it is right to say, Mr Speaker, and the Honourable Gentleman will be aware in relation to future court closures, we have identified that we will, uh, we will consult and have consulted, and that consultation has now come to an end on what principles will guide any future court closures in the future. Question number nine, please, Mr Speaker. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And with your permission, I would like to group question nine with question 23. Two. Two. I beg your pardon, sir. Um, the victim strategy is the first time we have looked in such detail in such a joined up way at how we treat victims of crime. The strategy provides the vision for the government's approach to victims. The government's Vogue strategy refresh, refresh and draft domestic abuse bill have been developed with this vision in mind and have been designed to sit within the framework of the widest victim strategy. The bill is a joint Home Office and MOJ bill with close ministerial and official level working to ensure close alignment. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Returning to a theme raised from the opposite benches earlier, uh, there is great support on these benches to close the loophole that may allow convicted rapists to gain notification rights to the child conceived through those heinous crimes. Um, could the Minister assure me that if it turns out that practice directives will not have the requisite strength, that legislation will be looked at? And when he meets with the Honourable Member for Ashfield to discuss the uh, Commissioner potentially having powers with regard to 12C, could he also include 12J for those same powers, which will also give safeguards to women and children? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, building on the answer I gave to the Shadow Minister, I hear what he says, and I know his work in this area and his commitment on this issue. Um, I'm very happy to look at the points he raises. It is a draft bill, and I very much hope that he will consider putting his views to us in that process. A word. Thank you, Mr Speaker. For many victims of domestic violence and coercive control, like my constituent Chloe, and for their families, the process of giving evidence preparing for trial uh, adds to the pain of the original abuse. What is the Minister doing to support vulnerable witnesses, including victims of domestic abuse? Thank you. Um, we are determined to improve the family justice response to vulnerable witnesses, including people like his constituent Chloe, and including victims of domestic abuse. Family judges have a range of powers to make sure difficult courtrooms situations are handled sensitively. In particular, we are looking to give the courts a specific power to prevent perpetrators of certain offences, including domestic abuse, from cross-examining their victims in person. We will also give the courts the power, in certain circumstances, to appoint a lawyer to conduct cross-examination on the preventive party's behalf. Mary Robinson. Mr Speaker. Mr Thank you very much. In the victim strategy published on the 10th of September, we committed to consult on the detail of a victim's law in the course of 2019. And in taking this work forward, we have already begun discussions with both victims and victims groups. We will consult on amending the victim's code before bringing forward detailed proposals for a victim's law. This will allow us to update entitlements to ensure they better reflect victims' needs before considering the detail of legislation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I welcome the, the Department's victim strategy, particularly the review of the Criminal Injuries Compensation Scheme. The Manchester Arena bombing almost two years ago left people with serious and life-changing injuries and brought to light questions about the scheme's suitability in providing support for victims of terrorism. Will my honourable friend outline what plans are being considered by the Department to improve support for victims of major tragedies such as the Manchester bombing? The Government is committed to ensuring that victims of terrorist attacks like the Manchester Arena bombing receive the help and support they need. In the victim strategy, we set out our intention to consult on changes to the Criminal Injuries Compensation Scheme, including considering how the scheme can better serve victims of terrorism. Terms of reference were published on the 18th of December 2018, with that review expected to report this year. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I say to the Minister, uh, my constituent, uh, Helen Hill, whose husband was murdered in 2002, has started a petition uh, which has over 8,000 names. This petition is about having provision for life for murderers. I'm sure he understands the suffering that she has suffered and is suffering to this day. Isn't she the sort of person who should be talking to him as a result of this? And would he agree to meet with me and Mrs Hill in the near future, please? Um, I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for raising that specific case, and I'm very, very happy to meet with him. Ian Bruce. Well, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd like to trade tribute to Lord Farmer for this review. We've accepted all the recommendations to the review. We've implemented more than half of them. I meet with Lord Farmer very regularly, and most recently last Sunday, because we realise that good family ties can reduce reoffending by 37 per cent. Bruce. Women prisoners face particular difficulties when parted from their families, as do their families. What consideration is being given to this, this issue? 
Well, the specific issue which is raised by the Honourable Member of Congleton relates to women in the criminal justice system, many of whom are actually the primary caregivers. So putting those women in prison, of course, has a very serious impact on their children, many of whom, unfortunately, then go on to commit crime themselves. We have therefore commissioned Lord Farmer to do a review looking specifically at the family ties of women. Bill Esterson. Number 13. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, as far as possible, we believe children should be diverted from the criminal justice system through liaison and diversion services. The, a custodial sentence should only be used as a last resort, and as we have seen over the past 10 years, the number of children entering the criminal justice system has fallen by 86%, with the number getting custodial sentences equally falling dramatically. Leicester, between 40,000 and 120,000 children are born every year with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, or FASD, according to the latest research. Those with FASD often don't understand consequences. So when you look at the special courts which have been set up in Canada, designed to reduce reoffending by helping those with FASD to understand the consequences of their actions. Minister. The Honourable Gentleman makes an important point, and if he writes to me with more details on that, I'm happy to look at it. If the Honourable Member for Mid Derbyshire were standing on this question, I would call her, but if she doesn't, I won't. But she is doing so, so I will. Pauline Latham. Thank you. As well as the um, importance of employment opportunities for ex offenders, would the Minister agree that the provision of affordable housing for former prisoners is also a significant um, factor in preventing? Reoffending, and can he outline what steps he's taking on this? And just a heads up, in case he requires it, the same would apply in a moment to the Honourable Gentleman the Member for Strangford. No, no, not now, but he can be working it up while the Minister's responding to the Honourable Lady. No, no, I'm giving him preparation time. He should be thanking me. Minister. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Honourable Lady, my Honourable Friend, makes a very important point about the importance of stable accommodation and how that can play a key part in reducing reoffending and giving people the opportunity to get their life back on the right track. We are working with partners across government, but also with local authorities and others, to ensure that the system works for those people. Oh, we're all now uncontrollably excited. Jim Shannon. Mr Speaker, you're most kind. Thank you very much. Uh, bearing in mind the latest report published showed the lowest reoffending rate in the 12-year time series for which data is available, would the Minister outline the alienation between training and education in prison and employment and a clean slate? And can the Minister give us the most recent statistics for reoffending rates with those who have gained qualifications whilst in prison? Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for his question. Reducing reoffending is a key goal of the prison system, as we set out in the White Paper. Plans like the NFN show that we are serious about this. Research published by the Ministry of Justice last year showed that prisoners who had undertaken learning activity have a significantly lower reoffending rate on release than their peers, with a one-year proven reoffending rate seven and a half percentage points lower in those statistics. Offenders who found P45 employment in the year after leaving prison had one-year reoffending rates that were six to nine percentage points lower than similar offenders who did not find employment. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, while the total number of children in prison has declined over the years, the number of black and ethnic minority children in the prison system has remained static. How can the Lord Chancellor be assured BME communities that their children are not being disproportionately targeted? Um, the Shadow Minister makes a very important point, building on the point from the Right Honourable Member for Tottenham earlier. I am concerned about the proportion of BMA, BAME children in custody. As the Lord Chancellor has said, it is something we take very seriously. It is something that runs through our response to the Lamy review and the race disproportionality work we undertake in the department. As with her colleague, I am happy to meet her on this topic if she would like me to. Mohamed Yassin. 14, please, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Uh, 
Uh, with your permission, Mr Speaker, I would like to group questions 14 and 16. Uh, we are making good progress with Wellingborough and Glenparva prisons, which will provide modern uncrowded capacity opening in 2021 and 2022, respectively. This is against the background where the long-term population trend has put a stress on the prison estate. I am pleased that the prison population has decreased by around 2,000 in the past year. We will continue to look how we can ensure further reductions, including looking at better community sentences. But our new prison estate will have up to 10,000 new uncrowded prison places that create the physical conditions for governors to achieve better educational, training and rehabilitation outcomes. Nearly two weeks ago, I raised concerns about broken screens at HMP Bedford, resulting in my constituents having to put up with loud, intimidating and lewd behaviour from prisoners and daily intrusions onto their properties by criminals smuggling contraband through their gardens over the prison's wall. The minister committed to immediately raising this with the governor. Will he confirm what action has been taken? Well, I know, I know that uh, my honourable friend, the prison's minister, has uh, indeed uh, visited uh, Bedford Prison and is in contact with the governor. I know that they we're introducing new scanners there uh, to help and address some of these issues. Uh, and uh, of course, we will of course look at uh, anything that we can do to ensure that uh, uh, no burden is placed on the local community. Baby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, overcrowding in our prisons um, leads to inhumane conditions and it puts the pressure on provision, services and training and this is unacceptable. The public expect reform and rehabilitation. What is the Minister doing to address this as well as the overrepresentation of black men within our prisons? Well, I, I agree with her about the importance of rehabilitation, and that is something that, uh, uh, that we have stressed. It's a point that has been stressed, I think, a number of times uh, just this morning. Uh, in terms of the overcrowding levels, we, of course we want to bring it down. It would be fair to say that the overcrowding levels have been pretty consistent. They are essentially at the same level that they were in uh, 2010. Uh, and in terms of uh, uh, the disproportionate numbers of uh, people from ethnic minorities within the prison system, it is something which, as uh, my my honourable friend, uh, uh, the, the, the parliamentary and the secretary of state, has just pointed out, is something that we take seriously, and uh, uh, I look forward to meeting the right honourable member for Tottenham to discuss this shortly. A source of overcrowding is the indefinite detention of prisoners using the uh, Imprisonment for Public Protection, the IPP sentences, which were introduced under the last Labour government but were ruled unlawful in 2007. Why is it that 3,300 prisoners are still in prison, having served their sentence, Many, 51% have served five years or more after their sentence, and are still in prison to this day? Well, it is the case that uh, uh, over time more of those uh, uh, IPP prisoners are being released, but there is a judgment which the parole board has to take in each individual case as to whether there is a risk uh, to society of releasing uh, the, a particular individual. Uh, and those judgments can be difficult. Sometimes the parole board faces criticism when they do uh, decide to release somebody in these circumstances, uh, and uh, these matters have to be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis. Hussein. Uh, Mr Speaker, almost half of prisoners held at HMP Birmingham last year were held in overcrowded cells, contributing to the crisis of violence that six months ago forced the government to step in and take control away from G4S. Uh, his minister was on the last occasion I asked unable to give a response. So will the Secretary of State confirm now that he will not be handing HMB Birmingham back to G4S and will he draw the obvious conclusion that privatisation has been a failure in our prison system? Well, in, in terms of uh, Birmingham, we, 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 we will not hand it back if it is not safe for us to hand it back. But I think uh, the attack on any involvement of the private sector in the prison system, uh, which is what we hear from the Labour front bench, I'm afraid is not taking a balanced approach. And I think one does have to look at the, success, the successes that exist within the prison system, uh, where the private sector have run very effective uh, prisons. And I think that cannot be ignored, notwithstanding the very real problems that exist uh, and have existed with Birmingham. 
Finally, before we move on to topicals, the Right Honourable Gentleman is an extraordinarily senior and distinguished denizen of the House, but he'll have to be a little patient, and, and he may get his chance in due course, queuing up with the rest. Meanwhile, he'll celebrate the success of his honourable friend, the Mayor for Caith and S. Sutherland and Easter Ross, I feel sure. Mr Jamie Stone. Yeah. Number 15, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Over time, we have invested more and more, particularly in individualised rehabilitation programmes. I would like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to Stephanie Covington and Edwina Grosvenor, in particular, for their trauma-informed approach to counselling. Jamie Stone. Mr Speaker, um, when you think about prisoners, all of us have a past which we cannot change, but we have a future which we can change, hopefully this side of eternity. There are many prisoners out there who have records of good conduct and are desperately trying to turn over a new leaf. Surely for this reason we should be doing everything in our power to encourage still more firms, companies and other organisations to offer suitable short-term placements to these people because these placements can be so much of a successful uh, rehabilitation. Whatever the word is. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Totally transforms a prisoner's life to have a job and leads them to be less likely to reoffend, therefore protecting the public. And I'd like to pay tribute particularly to Tempus Novo, for example, in Leeds, which brings businesses into the prison with two experienced ex prison officers and helps companies become comfortable with employing ex offenders, thus ultimately changing lives and protecting the public. Topical questions, Alan Mack. Topical one. Uh, Mr. Speaker, yesterday I published my review of the parole board rules and the government's response to the public consultation about creating a new reconsideration mechanism for parole board decisions. I have decided to proceed with changes to the parole board rules, which will introduce such a mechanism later this year. Our report also sets out additional reforms that will bring greater transparency and improvement for victims, and I announce the launch of a tailored review of the Parole Board as well, which will consider if more fundamental reforms are necessary in the longer term, including those which may require primary legislation. Mark. Thank you, Mr Speaker. New technology can play a key role in reducing the flow of contraband into our prisons. Can my right honourable friend outline what support and financial investment his department is making in this area? Um, I thank my honourable friend for that question. We are strengthening the countermeasures against contraband for every route into prison, and technology is an important part of this. In 2017, we invested £2 million in modern technology, including handheld and portable mobile phone detection devices. In 2018, we invested a further £7 million to enhance security in prisons through scanners, improved searching techniques, and phone blocking technology. Uh, and in the uh, work that my uh, honourable friend, the prisons minister, has done with ten of our most challenging prisons, uh, he is emphasising the use of technology to search letters, bags, and people. And last week announced that they all now have scanners that can detect drugs on clothes and mail. Yeah. Bergen, Mr. Speaker, there is deep concern that the government wants to use the cover of Brexit to roll back citizens' rights, and such. Fears have been further fuelled by the recent failure of ministers opposite in a letter to the House of Lords EU Justice Subcommittee to rule out repealing the Human Rights Act post Brexit. So, Mr. Speaker, Labour introduced the Human Rights Act. We will fight any attempt by the Tories to undermine it or to dilute our hard won rights. Will the Minister give the reassurances today that the Government will not repeal or reform the Human Rights Act in the aftermath of our departure from the European Union? Um, we certainly have no plans to do so, but if we're on the subjects of uh, human rights, I'm a little surprised that we're getting lectured by the honourable gentleman who won't condemn the Venezuelan regime. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Body-worn uh, video cameras are available to every prison officer in England and Wales, but they're not routinely provided in Scotland. Will the minister outline the benefits to both prisoners and to officers of having these cameras, and encourage the Scottish government to follow the lead of this government? Well, Mr. Speaker, we, we often uh, pay tribute to the Scottish government, but on this, I'm proud to say we are actually ahead of the Scottish government. We've got body-worn cameras rolled out. It's making an enormous difference to safety in prisons, and we are also ahead of the Scottish government in having fully smoke-free prisons. So there's something, at least, that Scotland can learn from us. Thanks, so well. Thank you. Does the Secretary of State agree that it is unconscionable that the workers and cleaners of the security guards who keep the MOJ safe are not paid the living wage? And will commit today to finally paying the wage they can decently live on and terms and conditions that mean they can take a family holiday? Very good. Um, 
Well, as the honourable gentleman will be aware, uh, the, uh, the cleaners and security guards are, uh, are employed by private contractors. That is the matter for the private contractors. David. Davis. You, Mr. Speaker, following the sexual assault of four female prisoners by a male claiming to be transgender, what additional advice has been given to prison authorities about, how, about housing transgender prisoners? Um, we take the Karen White case very seriously. In the light of that, we are reviewing both the content of PSI 17 stroke 2016, which sets the policy on these questions and its applications, and new guidelines will be published shortly to ensure it continues to strike the right balance between ensuring that all female prisoners are kept safe, that transgender prisoners have their rights respected, and that we comply with our legal obligations under statute. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can the Minister tell the House if it's a requirement for prison governors to stay up to date with control and restraint training in order to receive the RHA allowance? Um, this is a highly technical question. I will look into it and I will get back to the Honourable Member. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much. People were very shocked to read that over half the knife crime in London is associated with teenagers or children. But can my right hon. Friend reassure the House that he is working with the Home Office to make sure the new knife crime protection orders will effectively target those children who are carrying knives and not end up putting into custody children who are at risk but actually have never carried a knife? Uh, my little friend raises an important point. We are working with the Home Office to ensure these orders are truly preventative in nature and put children on the right path away from a life of crime. Uh, these orders will give the police uh, the opportunity to intervene earlier, and the court can include uh, in the order a range of conditions which can be both prohibitive and proactive. Uh, it is only if the court is satisfied on the balance of probability that the child has carried a knife or if they have been convicted of a relevant criminal offence and if the order is necessary to protect the public or prevent crime. Uh, uh, of course, sentencing is for uh, the particular judge, but we are of course, consulting on these proposals. The Secretary of State is providing much exercise for the knee muscles of opposition members. <laughs> An important fact of public interest, which I think thus far he has not noticed, but of which he may wish to take account. Stephanie Peacock. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Government continues to drag its feet in publishing its review into legal aid. Can the Minister today tell the House exactly when we can expect it by? Yeah. Mr Speaker, we said that we would publish the review early in the new year, and we will be publishing it early in the new year, and uh, the Honourable Member should expect it shortly. This is a serious matter that takes time. I would just like to quote the Honourable Member for Hammersmith, who told the Law Society Gazette uh, earlier last year, I would rather the Government take this seriously and take their time with it, and that is exactly what we have Access to justice was denied to my constituent who had her child taken away from her by social services after birth. She struggled to find legal representations because lawyers refused to take on a local authority with huge financial resources. How would the government help constituents like mine? Uh, the Honourable Member makes an important point, and care proceedings are incredibly important. When a, person, a child is taken away uh, from their parent, that is a tragic matter that affects them uh, for a long time. Uh, the Honourable Member should be aware that there is uh, legal aid available for public law cases. Um, but I'm very happy to discuss her particular matter with her. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Minister said earlier that the best help for rehabilitation is to have a job. So don't we need, therefore, to urgently reform the DBS system so we st still protect the public from dangerous criminals and dangerous people, but stop blighting the lives of hundreds of thousands of citizens who are trying to turn their lives around? Well, I'm grateful uh, to that question, and obviously there's been a recent uh, case on this, and I think we do need to look very carefully at this to ensure that we get the balance right between protecting the public but also ensuring that those who have committed a crime in the past are given a second chance and ability to turn their lives around. And uh, I, 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 I am keen to look further at this in the light of the recent judgment. One sentence. Bob Neil. Does the Secretary of State agree that it is vital to ensure continuity of contractual uh, obligations and enforceability of judgments once we leave the EU and that a no deal would prevent that? Yes. Splendid. Dr. Paul Williams. 
Speaker. NEPACs provide a very valuable family support service to Kirk Levington Prison in my constituency, but their big lottery funding runs out in May. Would the Minister meet with me in NEPACs to see if there's any way that we can continue this great service? Delighted to meet the Honourable Member and to meet as soon as possible. Northampton Crown Court, over the last eight years, the number of trials listed without a firm date and categorised as floating trials has increased from 10 per cent to 23 per cent. Why is this and what can be done about it? This is a really important point because uh, it is important that justice is done, uh, not not only done but done speedily. The issue of listing, I should emphasise, is a judicial function, uh, but it is important that HMCTS work closely with the judiciary on it. For that reason, I held a roundtable with the judiciary, with the listing officers, with the Bar Council, um, with the CBA and the Law Society only a few weeks ago to solve this issue. The sentence, David Hanson. Outstanding repairs in prisons are 22,000 higher than this time last year. Outstanding planned repairs, 9,000 higher. Why is this? Uh, largely to do with degradation across the estate, but we've had significant improvements both in terms of the performance of Amy recently and, of course, we've taken Carillion back into the house, so the government company is now operating that. We therefore expect improvements to go with millions of pounds of extra investment into the estate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the Minister agree with the Taking Control Coalition of Debt Support Charities that independent regulation of the bailiff industry is necessary to protect the public from unscrupulous practices which has driven some of my constituents to the point of suicide and despair? The, the Honourable Member is right to highlight that it is unacceptable for unscrupulous practice of bailiffs. It is a matter I know she will be aware of that we are looking into in our call for evidence, which closes uh, on the 17th. Of February, so I'd encourage anyone who's interested to submit. She will know that in that consultation, independent, an independent regulator is one of the questions that we are asking about. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, yeah. studies of offenders have suggested that 45% of young people and 24% of male adults screen positive for a childhood history of ADHD. Will the Minister therefore agree to attend the next meeting of the APPG on ADHD to discuss the ways we can reform the criminal justice system? Okay. Yeah, I will do my very best to attend that meeting. Mm. Chris Elmore. <laughs> Wales has the highest incarceration rate in Western Europe, which has risen to 154 per 100,000 population. Custodial sentences are also up in Wales, but dropped 60% in Wales, in, in England. So what more can ministers do to, to bring about a bespoke solution for Welsh um, prisoners and also to try and improve the criminal justice system in Wales. The the big transformation that is going to take place in Wales is that we are going to be bringing probation back fully under government control, so we will have a much more close connection between prisons, probation and the devolved authorities, which we think in the Welsh context is particularly suitable for the devolved administration and should address some of these concerns. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Why is it that grown men in their 30s and 40s involved in county lines cases are escaping jail, even though we know that the drugs that they traffic and the children that they traffic are blighting the lives of communities like mine and children growing up in communities like mine? Yeah. Well, this is an enormously important case. I mean, obviously, this is fundamentally a question for the police and the Crown Prosecution Service but absolutely agree that these people should be prosecuted and, indeed, should be put into jail. A South West London Knight, a former Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, and by all accounts, a cerebral denizen of the House of Commons, Sir Edward Davy. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker, especially for allowing me to exercise my knees more than usual today. Uh, will the Secretary of State confirm that the offer and acceptance of payments to and by an MP for the benefit of their constituents by a Minister of the Crown in an attempt to influence how they vote in this House could represent breaches of Sections 1 and 2 of the Bribery Act 2010. Well, I am loath to provide legal advice, um, but uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman has clearly raised a significant point. I I think I'd uh, like to hear perhaps more about what he is saying, and I'm happy to discuss this uh, with him, but uh, he's clearly alluding to something, but I'm afraid I'm not quite aware what it is. Thank you. Order. Before we move to the urgent question in the name of the Right Honourable Gentleman and the Member for Tottenham, I have a very brief announcement to make (coughs) to the House. 
Her Majesty the Queen has been pleased to approve that Dr John Benger be appointed Under Clerk of the Parliaments, that is to say, Clerk of the House of Commons, in succession to Sir David Nartsler, KCB, who retires in March of this year. For the benefit of colleagues and of others who take an interest in our proceedings, I can say that Her Majesty's approval of the appointment of Dr Benger followed an open competition and selection process comprised of an independent non-executive member and four MPs, myself, the Leader of the House, the Shadow Leader of the House and Stuart Hosey MP, who of course is a member with me and the Leader and the Shadow Leader of the House of Commons Commission. I would like to emphasise that it was an extremely robust and rigorous process and that Dr Benger was the unanimous choice of the selection panel. For those of you who don't know him, I hope you will come to do so. He is at present the Clerk Assistant of the House and Managing Director of the Department of Chamber and Committee Services. He has held that post since July 2015. My colleagues on the panel and I have come to know him well over the years. We believe that he has outstanding qualities and that he will be an outstanding successor to the outstanding clerk who is due to retire very shortly. I hope that that public information notice is of interest to the House. Order.